without further ado, really, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, introduce a BBC journalist, presenter, producer, and uh, disability campaigner, uh, Ellis Palmer, who's um, going to talk this evening about. Well, actually, this year, this year, Ellis has sort of been getting back on the on the hand cycle and really exploring the cycle paths and and other other options, shall we say, around uh, Merseyside. I think Alice is going to talk to us a bit about that, a bit about his experience um, and maybe some stuff about urban planning choices and, and things that make his life easier. So um, without further ado, Ellis, if you'd like to take over. Thank you. Hello, hand cycling. Yeah, I guess you probably call me a hand cycling nutcase, Gareth. Yes, indeed. Hi, I'm Ellis Palmer. I've never actually cycled, believe it or not, until uh, the what, mid, mid-March. Got my hand cycle. Yeah, the idea. I don't want to cycle, and being a wheelchair user, particularly as somebody living in cerebral palsy, is something I've never really considered as being an option, um, probably until until this time last year. And it was, I'd always thought, oh, it's for other people, it's for people who've got better upper body strength than me, or people who are maybe paraplegics. I live with cerebral palsy, so that means my hand-eye coordination and my balance isn't necessarily the best. And I, I thought, oh, you know, it's going to be too dangerous, one thing or another, I'll just steer clear from it. So I never really did it. And then it was when I was in Ireland, actually, last autumn, visiting a friend, we'd gone on a cliff walk from Greystones to Bray in County Wicklow. Beautiful cliff walk, fantastic. The only problem is my battery on my electric wheelchair died when we were 80% of the way to Bray and then we encountered loads of steps, so we had to turn back. And at that point, the battery died. So my mate had to push me. So I was like, he, he's, he's, a, he's a journalist, he's a, um, a football journalist in Ireland. And he basically said, oh, have you thought about hand cycling? And I thought, no, what's that? So he explained, he told me a bit more about it, told me about people who we knew in Ireland who were doing it. And I came back and I Googled it. I did my research and everything like that. And it turns out the guys have been making my wheelchair since I was nine or ten. Da Vinci Mobility over in over in Liverpool also make hand cycles. So at that point, I kind of went right. Next time I go in to get one of the things on my chair fixed, I ask them about hand cycles. Not really thinking that much about it, but I went o- went over to see the guy at Da Vinci when something on my chair broke in January. Got the got the chair fixed and I said about a hand cycle. I said, oh yeah, we'll take you out. So they took me out on one, loved it. Absolutely exhilarating. The freedom of being able to get get around and just being able to do that movement. I was a bit um I was a bit cautious about it really, I guess, starting off. But that is what it is. It's that with everything, when you're going to ride a bike, you're always a bit hesitant the first couple of times. And that was interesting. And then when so the hand cycle, my hand, because it's bespoke and everything like that, it didn't come until lockdown began on the, I think it became the week before lockdown began. So on the 12th of March, I think I picked it up. Went out that night, honestly, it was, it was phenomenal. It was great. And I'd never, ever cycled before. And um, so far, I've done about 5,700 kilometres, which is probably about what, touching 4,000 miles now. So to go from zero to that is, is, is some, may, some may say impressive. I may say I've still got a long way to go. But uh, but yeah, it's a great. And particularly if you've got the accessible cycling infrastructure or you've got the coastal pathways or you've got the river ooze or you've got, as you guys have in York, or that kind of thing, it makes a massive, massive difference. Greenways are great. Road cycling, is, I, I actually do quite enjoy road cycling on my hand cycle, but obviously that's fine in the summer, but in the winter there's extra considerations, as I'm discovering at the moment, lighting, dark nights, etc. can make things, make things a bit difficult. Um, so I guess, I guess from that perspective, I mean, I took it up, but uh, to be honest with you, when I first got the hand cycle, I thought, oh, this is going to be a bit of a novelty. I'm not going to really take this fat seriously, you know, I won't use it. It won't become a way of getting around. It would just be a novelty. A thing I do in a Sunday afternoon once or twice a month. And actually, for pretty much 100 days straight during my first lockdown, I went out on my bike every day. Obviously, you can do that in the summer. It's less rainy, it's less dark, it's less cold, etc. 
So it went from being something, a pay lot of money for you know, hand cycles, anything to do with specialized equipment with a disabled person is quite expensive. So I've gone from thinking, you know, it's going to be an expensive novelty to something I've, I've probably more than got my money's worth out of it um, in terms of getting getting out and getting about and getting around. So coming back to the point I made about accessible life, cycling infrastructure, probably my big, I guess there's a couple of bugbears. One is potholes. Potholes are an absolute nightmare. They, you know, particularly on a hand cycle when you're low down, when you've got three wheels to deal with, rather, and, you know, you've got a slightly wider area to deal with than just, say, a standard two-wheel bicycle, um, it makes it really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, if you get, you know, you may think you've dodged a pothole with, with the front wheel only to find one of the side wheels has got stuck. And that can make things really difficult. The other thing are U-frames. So a lot of, when I, actually one of the great, great examples I've seen of this is in, in Yorkshire, um, in my dad's hometown of Hull. Um, again, I have to, Bob sitting in the, in the room here, typical Zoom is sitting in the next room along for me. I don't think I would be going out on my hand cycle doing 20, 30, 40 kilometers pretty much every day without him. And it helps having somebody when you're first starting out who can, who can coach you, who can teach you how to do both on road and off road, because I think that's very important. I think there's a massive confidence gap for a lot of disabled people when it comes to being able to go out and use the hand cycles, but there's that confidence gap. There's a lack of, of, of safe infrastructure, a lack of parks that may be accessible in the local area, or, um, you know, and if, if there is on-road cycling provision, it's not segregated or it's not safe, or, you know, you're driving, you're driving your first couple of times on the road with cars whizzing past you at 40 miles an hour, and that's a bit uh, mind-blowing, to be honest with you. So that makes a massive, having somebody that you can buddy up with um, when you first start using a hand cycle, or to be fair, any kind of bike, I guess, really, any kind of cycle, um, makes a massive, massive difference. So I'm at a point about accessible infrastructure. A lot of the time when it comes to using trails, you'll find with a lot of trails, particularly off-road trails, have anti-motorcycle barriers on. Now, sometimes they are A-frames, sometimes they are what I call N-frames, sometimes they're like three-piece chicanes, and that can make things really, really difficult. And it's probably the biggest bugbear for me when I'm doing off-road off -road trails, when I'm going on cycling trails or something like that, because, you know, standard cyclists, Gareth or whoever, uh, you can get off, can't you? You can get off and you can walk around it. You can wheel, wheel, wheel around. Well, I, as a non-standard cyclist, can't do that. I can't take my front wheel off, wheel the chair and then clip it back on. It's too difficult. So that, that is a massive, massive barrier for a lot of people in terms of using off-road trails. Because obviously people don't necessarily always want to be on the road as their main way of getting around, but, um, but oftentimes off-road trails can be very, very inaccessible. Sometimes, you know, they can be fine if you're on a two-wheeled cycle, but if you're on a, a three-wheeled cycle, width is also a massive, massive consideration. Um, oftentimes, quite a few trails, the whole Hornsey Trail, um, the old rail trail, as it used to be. Another great, fantastic trail. I did it with my dad um, in May. Another great, wonderful. My dad had always wanted to do it because he, lived in East Hall and grew up there, but never actually got all the way on the trail. So we did it. And it was 20, I think 27 miles down back or something like that. But it was, it was a good route. It was a really, really nice route. But the problem is that route, you get to certain parts of it and it becomes very, very, very narrow. It was just fine if you're on a standard two wheel cycle. But if you're on a tricycle, a hand cycle or something like that, it becomes very, very treacherous to try and get through. And that's at the height of summer, so you've not got to deal with any um, puddles or anything like that. Honestly, at this time of year, I think it would be impassable. But thinking about that kind of thing, so it's about 
having limited barriers wherever possible, but are, but are passable by, you know, standard non -stand, sorry, a non-standard cycle user. It's about not thinking, taking your kind of non-disabled goggles off when you're designing cycle, cycle trails and thinking about how the trail can be genuinely inclusive and how it can be inclusive for disabled people and maybe going out with disabled people from your local wheels for your local inclusive cycling group going out with them and seeing what barriers they face or just having somebody in the local area if you're a local council officer or something like that that you can go to and say does this work does this not work um it can be can be really really helpful and particularly something i found in my local area of the world is that meeting you know cycling officers a lot of them haven't got the faintest idea what a, a non-standard cycle looks like so for them it, it's a bit mind-blowing in the first instance to go what is this non-standard cycle and then when they realize they can start to factor it in so the other the other barrier is probably attitudinal as well which is to say um what you know, a lot of disabled people don't think they can cycle. Some disabled people can't cycle, period. And you have to design infrastructure for them. You have to design roads for taxis that are appropriate and everything like that. But for disabled people who can cycle, sometimes the biggest barrier is attitudinal. But they haven't seen anybody do it. But they don't know, particularly that was my problem. I didn't know anybody who used a non-standard cycle. I didn't know anybody used a hand cycle or used something that wasn't a standard two-wheel bike. So that's a big barrier. And cost, cost is a massive, massive issue as well. I think your standard, non-standard cycle, and then my hand cycle sent me back about two grand. But if you're looking for an, uh, if you're looking for a hand cycle with a battery component, then that can go to, 3,500, maybe 4,000, anything shy of 5,000 is probably a decent price. These things are very, very expensive and with a lack of, of financial support that's available. So that can be a big barrier for really, uh, disabled people. You know, it's not just uh, go down to my local bike shop and pick up a second hand bike for 200 quid or whatever. That's just not an option for a lot of disabled people. And that's something that, that really needs to be, to be uh, factored in. Um, Kind of think if there's anything else. I guess I guess I'll open it to people's questions or your questions if you've got any, Gareth. Yeah. Yeah. So we had an finding out that um, even with even with two two wheel bicycles, a frames can be a real a real problem. It's something that we we kind of campaign to get rid of those as much as we can um, as a campaign. But oftentimes, if you speak to council officers, they'll say, oh, the airframe or the, the kind of end frame, most chicanes have got to be put in. So the biggest difficulty I found, particularly dealing with council officers, they, they, you, they're, they're always looking to be met halfway because their concern is, is the local residents. You know, if the local residents are complaining about antisocial behaviour or something like that, then something has got to be put in there. Uh, it's just what that is and how it can be done. I know some people talk about CCTV cameras. Other people are quite nervous about uh, having CCTV cameras in because it's maybe a step too far for surveillance. So not that I don't want people to see me wearing my York City Knights rugby league uh, top on any cycles, of course. <laughs> we that is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that is uh, York themed apparel there but uh, but yeah you've got to meet your um council officers halfway if you know the main and the spirit of negotiation is sometimes all about compromise mm. um so um I, i'm gonna go through some of the wordy questions here so jamie has asked um whether uh, jamie wood has asked whether you've challenged a barrier in the wirral at all yeah quite a few um but i'll give you one specific example actually but it's a bit heartbreaking was I've been cycling about a month and a half and there was my father had very cleverly decided we were going to go on this trail we were going to go from Holy Lake to the River Way and it was great everything was going really really good we were having no problems and then we got to this three-part chicane and as I went around the three-part chicane my wheel and the bit that connects my my wheel to, to the train came off, broke off. 
and came off completely severed off and with no way of there's no way of um no way no way of fixing it back on so if actually came came there I and mean, i had a track people in my, in my local area and they said get in touch with this council officer so i did get in touch with him i'm not i've not been down that way recently so i'm not sure if it has been taken off but from that consultation i was able to meet up with him both challenge the barrier and also have a chat with him so he was aware of what my non-standard cycle was like. And that broke up and that would have caught, fortunately I was able to get it fixed with some probably very advanced super glue from the guys who make my hand cycles at Da Vinci over in Liverpool. But that would have cost me 600 quid otherwise, which is a lot of money for one tiny little bit of component, it's, it's a shame. And if if you make things that are too narrow, for, I'll give you a story, with a, it's again a U frame. A friend of mine's got a Jorvik. Hey, the Jorvik from York, of course. Uh, the tricycle makers, very, very good. And we went cycling one day on this trail, and you get to the end of the trail, and there's an end frame barrier. Now I could somehow just about manage to get through it on my hand cycle, but my mate couldn't get through it in his Jorvik. And that's the kind of barrier that, that people, you know, oftentimes don't think about. They don't think about not just. It's not just about disabled cyclists, you know, anybody can use a, a non-standard cycle because maybe they find a tricycle more comfortable or something like that. So um, I'm going to keep working my way through. Thanks. That was a, that was a really interesting uh, answer, Alice. Um, Kate asks, do you use your cycle just for leisure or do you use it for everyday getting around too? Everyday getting around, everyday getting around, yeah. Um, I mean... Every day getting around, meeting friends, obviously lockdown is a bit strange at the moment because, you know, can't really go anywhere, working from home, you're in the home office now as we speak. So it's a bit difficult in terms of getting getting around, but I do use it for every day getting around. If you, I've gone over to Liverpool, got the ferry over, the River Mersey, and that was great. Gone, went for lunch, cycled back home or meet up with friends for, for lunch and then cycling so use it for probably a mix of a mix of leisure and getting around meeting people going for coffee whatever it may be despite the strange 2020 circumstances we find ourselves in <laughs> thanks alice uh, andy asks uh, can you give us an idea of the kind of barriers that you can negotiate weirdly a frames actually i can just about fit through an a frame because of the way the a frames are i would be trying to at the top my obviously the fact that my hand cycle is lower down means that i can actually get through the a-frame now obviously that's not ideal for people who are on trikes or people who are on hand cycles but maybe a bit higher up or people who are on recumbents but somehow my hand cycle and my wheel chair my wheel bit of a chair is just narrow enough that i can get through on an a-frame there's been a couple of hairy moments where we've gone oh am i going to get through this but somehow yeah a-frames i can negotiate and they can be you know, if you're talking to a council officer who's who's worried about, you know, taking his um his end frame out or his chicane or something like that, then A frames sometimes can be kind of a halfway point if council officers haven't got the money to um put in CCTV cameras or whatever. Yeah, I think that's 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 an interesting answer actually. It's um, food for thought. Uh, Erica's pointing out there's some nice footage of you on the Wheels for Wellbeing website actually. If you uh, if you out on the hand cycle, so if anyone wants to see what the the kind of it's actually quite useful for seeing the dimensions of the hand cycle actually. There's some good video footage there. There's a great one actually. I send I, I put a clip in the chat in a bit. It's a great one. One of my first one of the first routes I went on. Quite a lot of it is segregated here in the Royal Peninsula. And I just went out and did a video just of my kind of standard route on the day-to-day -day basis that I do in terms of getting around getting around on the coast. So I'll put that in the chat, Gareth. Oh, yeah, that'll, that'll be fantastic. Um, Jamie asks another question, which is, um, have you tried using your hand cycle as a mobility aid in uh, in a restricted area, such as a station or a shopping centre? And, and what reactions have you had, if you have? Yeah, I mean, I have tried using it in, um, well, tried to obviously... Whenever I go into somewhere, I go in there, and even, even, like, even if I want to unclip my hand cycle, I have to, obviously, two things. One, my hand cycle's got a little bit of e-assist on it. I live on a massive hill here, so getting up and down the hill without the e-assist. Some may call it cheating, but I do need the power assist to get up and down the hill, let me tell you. Um, so, for me, as long as if I was to go into a shopping centre or a railway station or whatever, 
it's only the third or a common promenade restaurant in that area. Basically, as long as when I go in, I turn my ear assist off, there's generally no problem. It's, you know, if I go into the local shopping centers or whatever, or the shopping area, as long as I turn my ear assist down to the lowest level or turn it off completely, that can make it quite quite a bit easier. Um, so that, that's, that's one thing. Have I used it in, in, indoors? Once or twice in shops, obviously whenever I go into anywhere, I have to um, unclip it. So sometimes that I have to unclip it from the front of the from the front of the side from the front of my wheelchair, and then the wheelchair is just a standard two wheel two wheel two wheel wheelchair that I can I can wheel around, mm. um, which which um, but sometimes be a bit strange for a lot of people, but no. He's on the cycle and he's unclipping it. What's going on here? But that, that, that's the real advantage of a clip on is that if I do need it to go in to being a two wheeled wheelchair, I can just do that right off. Or indeed, four wheeled wheelchair because obviously you've got the two front wheels at the front. But, uh, but yeah. So Eric asks uh, an interesting question from a, a kind of a, an understanding size perspective, which is um, if a tricycle can get through a barrier, do you find that a hand cycle will likely fit through the same barrier? Like, have you have you seen how your hand cycle compares to other non-standard cycles? Well, again, it's one of those weird ones. It's like what I was just saying about the A-frame mare, Gareth. The fact that I can get through an A-frame on a hand cycle because I'm low. So mm. I'm lower than a kind of standard cycle, for want of a better term, or a standard tricycle. But, say, a tricycle user or a standard cycle user would not be able to get through. Um, generally speaking, the standard guide is if, if a tricycle user can get through a barrier, then I'm going to be able to get through um, some, and I'm going to be able to get through a barrier on a non-standard cycle as well, or my hand cycle, indeed. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's useful. Uh, Tim, Tim's pointed out some design rules that should catch all of these different types of, uh, of of wheelbase, if you like, or the, or the wheel plan, and also the height. Um, so, so theoretically, the new standard, the new design standards, should capture the the different sorts of bicycles, non-standard cycles, hand cycles, tricycles, cargo bikes that exist. But um, retroactively applying those can be a bit more interesting for local authorities. I think. Any other questions? Exactly. That that is that is the challenge for, for yeah. local authorities. Sometimes it's that they will have their retroactive. You know, there'll be the new cycle lanes that we'll point to or whatever. These are great, these are wonderful. But then there'll be the trail that you use every day on the council estate to get around, to get to where you want to get to. And it's got loads of potholes in the trail or there's weirdly loads of end frames just randomly placed in the middle of it. And that can be the biggest difficulty. It's not so much for new trails, that counts as a building, it's the older trails that they've got to go back and retroactively change. So uh, we've got two questions from Kate, um, both about um, discovering uh, cycling and about how people can be encouraged to find it earlier. So the first question is, um, what would have helped you to discover cycling earlier? And the second question is, how can disabled children be encouraged to find it earlier? So um, I guess that's a two-part, that is a very good two-part question. What would have encouraged me to find it earlier? I don't know, um, really. Um, probably seeing it, that visibility, that notion of, oh, you know, you can do it. Because you see a lot of, you know, non-disabled people using cycles, or non-physically disabled people using cycles as a way of getting around, and that, that's that. And you just assume that. And I always remember when I get taxis into work, and I used to work in London before lockdown, and you'd see, the cyclist zoom me past and I think, oh, I wish I was not, I wish I was able-bodied, I hate that term, but I wish I was able-bodied and I'd be able to use um, a cycle to get around. But actually, yeah, but, but more visibility, more information. There is a massive mm. information gap. There's not enough people know about hand cycles or know about non-standard cycles. It's just assumed that, oh, you're disabled, so you're not going to be able to do it. The cost barrier as well, because these things are expensive. And if there are schemes available to, to reduce the cost through access to work or cycle to work schemes, that can be can be advantageous. The well, the other thing actually, weirdly enough, 
um, there's a group called Cycling Projects, and they run um, wheels for all centres all around the UK. Um, weirdly, they're not in York. Your nearest one is in Leeds, I believe. But I'm sure York mm. has its own um, non-standard uh, inclusive cycling infrastructure. But they've got um, wheels for all centres all around the UK. As I say, there's one in Leeds, there's one in Havercroft in South Yorkshire, they've got some big centres in Sheffield, they've got lots of centres around the northwest and uh, Midlands of England as well. So that can be um, just finding one of those and going along with one of those and trying out all the different types of non-standard cycles. I know young people that I know in kind of Greater Manchester go on to those centres and it gives them a greatly increased notion of, of, of cycling. The weird thing is the guy who is the CEO of Wheels for All is actually from my hometown um, and he lives like five minutes down the road from me. Hello Ian. But the fact that I didn't know, I didn't know in my local park near me that there was a Wheels for All centre with all types of non-standard cycles available would have been great. But as I say, it's the information gap. It's the fact that people oftentimes don't know about the include, I don't know about the, the not the infrastructure, but the resources that are, are available in my local area. Ah, good to hear, John. Good to hear that York has a disability cycling hub. I know Hull does as well, but it's about having a site that people can go to where they can type in my postcode and look at a map. It's screen reader friendly, of course, but look at a map and go, oh, this is where the, the, um, the kind of uh, nearest inclusive cycling hub is to me. The Wheels for, Center, the Wheels for Wellbeing website, the Cycling Project website, has a great map but obviously not all inclusive cycling centres are on there but as I say there's 54 mostly in England and Wales but but yeah looking at that and finding that information and seeing what's available in your local, local area is, is, is a great way of doing things. Thanks Alice that's uh, yeah that's a that's a really fascinating series of um series of answers. I are, think there, gonna... are there any are there any races Erica? Yes there are races there are races and there are competitions I've not been bothered to enter any yet maybe next year maybe <laughs> you'll see me at Tokyo 2021 or whatever it's going to be after that. <laughs> Thanks Alice that's um so I think that's all we've got time for in terms of questions some really interesting questions there for uh, about all sorts of different things. Alice that was uh fascinating and very uh, insightful actually uh, certainly for me it's got a lot of cogs whirring of some of the things that we can do as a, as a cycle campaign to sort of um, enhance uh, how, how we kind of improve accessibility for cycling across the board so um yeah i, I think um i don't know whether we all want to kind of clap and i don't know how that comes through it's just everyone's just going to hear me clapping because i'm the only person who's not <laughs> muted so it's a bit, a bit weird but ellis thanks for that that was absolutely fantastic cheers i'm going to clap yeah, silently guys, so thank it's not you very much. <laughs> thanks ellis thank you